We're here at the uh, California International Book Fair in San Francisco. It's February 16th, 2013. And we're going to be talking next with Larry McGilvery, who uh, is a dealer mainly in art-related material, yeah. would you say? Contemporary and, and modern, mostly. Temporary and modern. Yeah. And um, a person uh, I met for the first time when he came out to the uh, bookseller seminar in uh, Denver, or I believe it was in Denver. Yeah. And, uh, and made quite a good hit for himself uh, <laughs> by entertaining all those hundred people who came to see him. So, Larry, I'm going to start with you, with, like do everybody else. Give us a biography. Talk a little bit about your family life. Do you have siblings? What your mom and dad did? What schools you went to? Uh, and take us, take us up to the point where you decided that perhaps this might be a good business to be in. So start pretty much at, at <laughs> Okay, beginning. very briefly. I, was, I grew up in Hollywood. Uh, brought up by my uh, very English grandmother, and uh, who was a wonderful, wonderful parent. And uh, I went to Hollywood High School, I went to LA City College for two years, and then through a, uh, one of these branching paths, I, I, a fellow I met on the, on the street corner right by my house sent me off to Pomona College, uh, where he said they treated him very well, and I went there and they treated me very well. And uh, from that flows everything else in my life. Uh, I uh, had to have a major, so I majored in music without any intention of ever using it. I wanted a liberal education. And uh, the most valuable courses I took in my entire school life were in high school, typing, and in college, uh, languages. Uh, a smattering of German, French, uh, Spanish and Latin, which have served me I incredibly well. Oh, I would imagine. Ever so. since then, I, I'm not fluent in any of them, but uh, I. But I you can't know, booksellers, yeah. French and booksellers, exactly. Swedish. And, uh, exactly, I can deal with any any Western European language yeah. and even a couple of Eastern European ones now. And uh, uh, so then, having been a music major, of course, I became an engineer for six years. What kind of engineer? Well, it was quality control engineering. It was real simple stuff. And I was, frankly, quite good at it. <laughs> sort of invented my own job. And uh, at the end of that time, uh, uh, my wife Geraldine and I had moved up to um, San Francisco, up to the Bay Area. And uh, the, the job was getting old. And she said, why don't we open a bookstore? She said that? Yes, yes. And she wanted to move back down to San Diego. Well, to, back for her to San Diego, where she'd grown up. And uh, so we ended up uh, buying a little bookshop for a um, thousand dollars plus the stock, I think was another thousand, uh, called the Nexus. And um, year, that was on November 15th, 1960. And uh, exactly a year later, we were arrested for selling tro Tropic of Cancer. Uh, That's another whole story. Yeah, I, well, we, we, if you had a two-hour interview, why we could yeah, deal with that? Yeah, uh, obviously. But, uh, but the upshot of it was that we, uh, uh, six months later, we had a three-week trial in which we proved to a non-reading San Diego jury that the Tropic of Cancer was not obscene. We were acquitted with headlines like this in the San Diego Union. Wow. And, uh, were you used as some and sort I, of and test I got case? And I got 13... Uh, 13 votes for sheriff of San Diego County. <laughs> <laughs> right in votes. Seri right. Seriously. But yeah. was this a test case for the courts? It, it was one of many cases. There one were 60 men. some cases. When the paperback came out at, in uh, the middle of 1961, Barney Rust was sort of forced into this. Uh, when that came out, uh, because somebody, the, the copyright was in question and somebody else was going to publish it, so he got forced into doing this. It, as I say, it's a long, long story, a fasc yeah. fascinating story, which I hope to get written down someday. But it would be nice if you would do something yeah. like that so others could share your experience, right. especially with that. So in the so meanwhile, we had four children. Well, one of, we had three at that point. And um, we had the store for six years. And in the meanwhile, after that, I, uh, I got uh, involved in selling first uh, imported books to libraries. I was traveling around the state selling uh, art books in, in English that were not available in this country. And, uh, and then I, uh, I bought my first 
my first library from a man, man named uh, Samuel Breyer, who had a uh, shop in Claremont called the Claremont Book and Art Shop. He and his wife, Ruth, ran that shop from the 1940s. I haven't quite pinned down the date yet. I still yeah. still have a few bunch of few directories. When did to look it stop? At. When did it cease? Um, a little after 1960. And if we had if we had still been in Claremont at that time, there is not a doubt in my mind that we would have ended up yeah, buying his inventory with that, with that stock yeah and and uh, and I got his uh, a few years later I uh, about 63 or 64 I acquired his um, his out of print inventory and I wish I still had had all of it yeah, we, all, we all wish we had those books yeah I know instead it was, of what uh, we can get now I mean he had the the heirs to George Gross Mapa <laughs> <laughs> which was um, they weren't really original lithographs, although the publishers said they were. But they they were they were all, uh, offset. Uh, re well, they were reproductions. I, I I ran into found the drawing of one, the original drawing of one of them once. Breyer was one of the I believe he was one of the founders of the Southern California chapter, and uh, he was one of the really influential people in my life. He, he I I had about a uh, maybe an hour hour and a half instruction from him on how to write. A catalog entry, really, <laughs> and that is the extent of my formal <laughs> formal training. training yeah. Most of us learn by the seat of our pants, exactly, we, yeah. or we uh, apprentice with some large firm. Yeah. We learn what we can, and then we go out on our own. Is right. what it, that's right. the way it used to be? I don't know how it is today. And, and the thing that he impressed upon me, because he had several publications of this sort, was plates loose as issued. <laughs> yeah, loose as issued. <laughs> loose as issued. That was very important. Yeah, I suppose it was. It okay. still is. <laughs> well, let me let me uh, shift gears with you now sure. and talk a little bit about the phenomenon of the internet. Oh. What, what does the internet oh. provide for you in your business? Well, in 1991, I bought a collection. I bought a collection, two thirds sight unseen, 516 cartons, wow. in Poughkeepsie, New York, of stuff, and I knew. When the, f the moment I laid eyes on it, on the part that wasn't already packed, I knew where it had come from. And I have been mining that stuff for over 20 years now. Wow. And it's, uh, I, I keep thinking, well, I have come to the, I can't do another fair with new stuff. And here's another fair yeah. done with new stuff. It's, uh, it was an amazing collection. It was just the residue of this collection because Ars Libri bought all the major books. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they told me that they sent a van uh, to, from Boston every weekend for months yeah. picking up this collection and uh, some of it was, it had fallen, it had gone into other hands from the original owner by the time I got to it. And some of those cartons were full of old, broken, partial encyclopedias. Quite a few of them, actually. Well, I and suppose junk. you have to take the good with the bad, too. And so, when I got this stuff and I started putting it out, there was all, you know, all this interesting-looking stuff. I had no idea what it was, hmm. and no way in in San Diego of researching it. And so I just stuck it aside. And the last four or five years, now that uh, you know that it's so easy to find find things, I go and I've I've gotten very good at doing, uh, researching these things, and um, so I keep finding treasures. So it's you, you use the internet as a buying tool as well as a selling tool? I, to some extent, but I don't, I haven't been buying much because I have too much material. Uh, well, you wanted to feel. One, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, it's, it's nice to have too much material that's good. Most of us have too much material that can't be sold. Well, I have a lot of that too. Yeah, well, I think it's, it comes with the territory. Yeah, but as far as the other half of the internet, uh, oh, what can you say? You know, I mean, it's it's a disaster. Yeah. You know, it's, it's a race a, to the bottom. It's a, yeah, race to the bottom. Absolutely. I mean, I found that there are, there are three things that you need to do to be on the internet: have the best copy, the cheapest copy, or the only copy. Exactly. Yeah. And if you yeah. can fit one of those three criteria, you'll be okay. Yeah. Unfortunately, most of us can't fit. Yeah. You know, I know. I know. It's it's. Uh, I mean, and and the the the, in my field, a factor of a price factor of ten is commonplace. Absolutely. A, a price price factor of a hundred is not un, un not unheard of. 
and uh, it is just it is just astonishing. And then you you know it it just completely throws uh, people who want to become collectors off because you know why is this copy five hundred dollars and this one is five dollars? What's the difference between them? And there isn't any difference. And there are all these sharks and pirates and uh, and uh, you know bottom feeders out there who. Well, that's, you know, uh, it, there's no restrictions on who can list books with no, uh, those I know. places. No, I and I don't understand the, I, I mean, I literally don't understand the, the financial uh, uh, viability of these penny or 99 cent or dollar dealers. I don't understand how Well, the, I think that the gimmick is that they charge you like $5 a book. To, to ship it, and it really is only costing them like $2 to do it, so they make money Well, I know that, but, that. Then, but then Abe, for instance, has, has a 350 limit, so, or whatever it is now. I mean, I, I don't understand it. It's and there's a, there's a place called, uh, I don't remember quite how it's named, but they have uh, invented technology that when a copy comes on, onto the internet, oh, they yeah. automatically, their book automatically oh, becomes yeah. 50, percent, 50 cents cheaper yeah, than I the know. cheapest uh, copy. And, and you end up with, with, with yeah, these with incredible the, surges or, or plummets. All over the place. Yeah, it, yeah, it's yeah, unbelievable. Yeah. Okay, let's talk a little bit about um, some of your uh, recollections of the trade. You've been, how long have you been a member of the ABAA, for example? Can you? 1973, I think. Think. So you're, you're a 30-year guy? 40. You're a 40-year guy? Yeah, God. Yeah. The time passes when you're having fun, isn't it? <laughs> 40 years. Wow, 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 wow. Okay, so 40 seven, years 72 ago... 72 or 73. But 40 years ago, the world of books was an entirely different place to be uh, involved yeah. in. Oh, uh, yeah. A much sweeter and wonderful oh, time. Oh, yes. Oh, yes, yes. Much you sweeter could, and wonderful. You'd walk in any decent bookstore and find something worth buying. Absolutely. Yeah. Fourth Avenue was the happy hunting ground. Yeah. Or, yeah. And there were places like that all over the country. Yeah. Um, what do you see as the greatest challenges facing the antiquarian book trade in the in the oncoming years? Well, I mean, the used book trade is practically defunct, except for internet sellers, and um, and the problem for the antiquarian book fair book trade is that the, as I see it, that the Everybody seems to be dropping out the mid-range mid stuff and the cheap things. So that means that you have this, now there's this inflation of the, the really high-end stuff just in, within the trade. Right. And that, that happened in a smaller scale back in the 90s, early 90s, as I recall. That, uh, that I don't know, maybe at that point a lot of new people came in with money, came into the trade, and suddenly uh, prices of really good stuff went, went skyrocketing and rocketing. So you end up with uh, a, a stratospheric final, um, final um, clientele. Yeah. And, uh, and it, uh, except that what, what does happen is that new areas keep opening up. Yeah, new areas of, of interest keep opening up. There, there should be continuing new areas. I know we have a new member in our association who deals in rock and roll memorabilia. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. I mean, I, I think to myself, wow, that sounds like really fun. That sounds it cool. Is. <laughs> it is. It's awesome. really cool. Can you make a living doing it? I yeah. don't know. Oh, they're right just a few blocks from here. There's a place called Wolf, Wolfgang's Vault, a, a warehouse full of that stuff. Really? Yeah, yeah. I sold them a whole bunch of, a whole bunch of early Rolling Stones several years ago and, and was in the place, and it's just astonishing. They must have a large clientele. They have a huge clientele, yeah. I mean, you know. Yeah, they're, they're selling, uh, you know, memorabilia and uh, probably records, certainly all the printed materials and, I mean, all, all kinds of things. Sounds, sounds incredible. Um, but let's get back to the question. Yeah, of course. Uh, well, the, the great challenges that face us as booksellers in the decades well, to come. Well, two two weeks ago, I exhibited at the L.A. Art Book Fair, which is uh, sponsored by Printed Matter, which has run a fair like this in New York for seven years. This was the first one. It was at the Geffen Center, a big big place uh, related, uh, connected to uh, Museum of Contemporary Art in Los Angeles, right in uh, Little Little Tokyo, right yeah, near the, I know the area. station. And uh, there were 16,000 people came. Wow. Young, enthusiastic, many of them extraordinarily knowledgeable. We were busy practically all the time. 
uh, we took a, a wide range of stuff and uh, did, you know, not brilliantly, but did pretty well. And uh, I think we wrote 75 invoices well, so that's in that period of time. For some people, that's a month's sales. <laughs> yeah. When you think about it. Oh yeah, yeah. That's well. It's more than a month's sales for me because I have so little material on the internet. Uh, and uh, are you still issuing catalogs? <laughs> one for this fair, one two weeks ago, and another one in uh, a couple of months for a conference I go to. But so you. you but they're very short. They're very but small. But the list catalogs. that you're preparing to to uh, sell books are basically made for the particular fair or show you're going yeah. to be exhibiting a part of. Yes, yes. They're not sent out to your entire mailing list. Well, I send out some. Not, not a great deal. Not a great deal. Yeah, yeah, but... Uh, okay. Um, tell me a little bit about some, if there were any, and who they might be, who you might consider mentors or strong influence on you uh, Members of the well, trade. Certainly, Sam Breyer, who was a uh, principal man. He was a supporter of the local art scene. There was a, quite a large artist community in Claremont, connected to Scripps College and yeah. uh, else other parts of the community. And uh, he he showed their work. He supported them. He bought their work. Uh, he was um, he was a quite a wonderful man in in his way. And um, among other people, Peter Howard uh, would rank very high. He always treated me. I know people didn't like him and people thought he was abrasive and so forth. He always treated me extremely well. And Larry, Larry McMurtry. Oh, yeah, uh, Larry. Who, who is an old friend going back uh, 40 years or so. I, uh, yeah, at least over, over 40 years. And he, uh, again, uh, has treated me very well. And I, other than that, um, uh, now this is awkward. Who am I going to leave out? <laughs> uh, well, you know, it, it, it's a question that you, you're asked to, to give an immediate reply to, so don't, nobody's going to be uh, mad at you for leaving them out. Just to, you Well, know. I mean, there are, there are plenty of people whom, uh, well, whom yeah. I really, really, really admire and think extraordinarily highly of. Uh, I could mention um, Ralph Sipper, for instance, I could mention uh, uh, God, my mind's going blank. It usually does when somebody asks you a question like that. Like that, I know, I know. <laughs> I don't mean to put you on the uh, spot, but... C c certain people that just uh, ring very true to me. Jennifer Larson is one of them. Yeah. Uh, even though I never have any, never, I don't think we've ever done any business together, and yet I have a strong sense of who she is and yeah. what, what she stands for. Yeah. And uh, uh, I've had, you know, I've had close relationships with a lot of, a lot of book dealers. Um, Richard Press and, uh, oh, I'm, I'm leaving out. That's okay. 20 you, people. I'm sure, I'm sure we, we all, we all have that issue. There's always one that creeps into your mind immediately and then you have to start thinking about all the others who, mm -hmm. who helped pave the way for you to be what you are today. Right. Yeah. I have one last question. Right. If you were starting, uh, <laughs> if uh, a young person came to you and said, Mr. McGilvery, I'm interested in, in going into the book business, uh, what's the most important thing for me to have? Or what's the most important thing uh, in, in, in the book Own business? Own your building. That's what Doug Harding said. <laughs> exactly the same thing. Own your own building. <laughs> that's, the, that's the most important thing. No, I mean, it, as far as the book trade goes, well, it, it depends on what they want to do. I mean, if they want to handle strictly English language material, then telling them to get languages doesn't matter. Right. Uh, if they don't, if they, if they have a more eclectic uh, field of view like I do, then I would tell them languages. Languages. I tell them get, get, get languages. Just working, a simple working knowledge of, of the major Western European languages. And, um, uh, oh, I'll tell you somebody else, Chuck, Chuck Vilnius. Oh, yeah, Chuck. Uh, Chuck's he's, a sweetheart. He's, I mean, he's really extraordinary. I mean, but what he has done with his, his material, uh, 
And um, I think uh, I would say learn to catalog properly. Oh, yeah. I think that's the most important thing. Now that, that's, I spent a lot of time doing that. I put a lot of thought into my cataloging, and I think it shows. No, it, do. It, it may, it, to some people, it may seem excessive the amount of <laughs> uh, the, the amount of detail. But I, I mean, some some of my colleagues uh, put me to shame. I mean, the the scholarship uh, that goes into some of these. Uh, remarkable descriptions of you know an 18th century book yeah and and who owned it and all of these things uh, tracing it back uh, you know I most of my material doesn't doesn't lend itself to that kind of thing and uh, they're uh, I, I mean, forgot to mention Jake Satan of course um, but I think that the catalog entry is what, to, to a, somebody who can't see the book, I think that's what presents it. Well, it's and to be, to be absolutely transparent and absolutely straightforward and accurate. And um, when I do make the rare mistake, it's always an embarrassment. I hate doing it. <laughs> Yeah, especially if it's a spelling mistake. Huh? Well, we've come to the end of our time. All right. Larry, thanks Thank very so much, much for coming by. I enjoyed Thank talking you. with you. Okay.